Hey everyone, welcome to Berean On Demand. We're continuing our Investigating Jesus series. Thanks for joining us. I hope you'll stick around. Good morning, church family. Is this a beautiful time of year or what? Now, just to put this in perspective, you realize that large parts of our country right now are dealing with drought and wildfires, and other parts of our country are dealing with tornadoes, and the rest of the country is bracing for hurricane season, and we're up here in upstate New York. Lush paradise. I know we complain about weather most of the year, but man, just soak this in. And you know what? If you travel, you realize that they have scorpions and cockroaches and poisonous snakes in other parts of the country, and we just don't. Most things don't live here, including people, and it's great. (laughs) So let's enjoy this time of year, okay? Thank you for being here. September 4th, 2018, something significant happened. You may not remember, but it was a big deal. In fact, the news locally was blowing up when a very important person was spotted in our region. The place was Dave's Dairy Bar in Cincinnati. The person was none other than Justin Bieber. And when he stepped up to the counter, those of you in Cincy, you remember this distinctly, when he stepped up to the counter to order his ice cream and the young lady behind the counter asked his name and he said, Justin, news articles wrote, she screamed. I've ordered ice cream and I've said my name was Justin. No one ever screamed. I (laughs) am missing something. But I'll tell you, social media blew up. It was all over the news. It was a really big deal. Why was it such a big deal? Because famous people don't typically visit small towns and small places. And that's just an accepted part of life when you live in a rural area. It's just something all of us come to realize, is that rural places are often the forgotten places. They're often the passed over places. In fact, in rural areas, what's normal is that change is usually slow Decline is usually common, isolation is typically high, poverty is usually widespread. Am I describing rural area? Right? That's typically what we experience. In fact, most young people who grow up in rural areas can't wait to go away when they grow up. And so there's a complex that people that live in the country tend to develop, but at one point in history there was a VIP visit to a small town. And when that VIP visit happened in the small town, there was an announcement that was made that was earth-shaking, history-changing. And it was not an accident that that announcement happened in a small, rural place. I want you to see this story with me. So if you would turn in your copy of the Bible to John chapter 4, we're going to look at a very important visit to a very unimportant place. Uh, We are investigating Jesus this spring by going through the first few chapters of the account of his best friend, John. And John walked and talked and lived with his friend Jesus. And he wrote later in his life, he sat down and he wrote down what he saw, what he heard. And this is known as the finest firsthand account of the life of Jesus that we have John chapter 4 is where we pick up today, and we're starting in verse 1. I forgot to mention, if you're using a chair Bible, page 854. If you'd like a Bible, please, by all means, take that with you as our gift. Um, As we dive in this morning, I want to welcome the uh, place where Justin Bieber passed through, Cincinnati, New York. (laughs) There was some hoots and cheers from Bieber fans here, just so you know. Uh, And also Bainbridge, New York. I don't think you've had a Justin Bieber sighting yet, but maybe someday. Justin Bluer sighting. People don't scream about that. I'm sorry. John chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. That's what Rick covered last week in, in a great message talking about, you know, less of me, more of Jesus. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. 
Okay, so here's what's going on. Jesus' fame is growing. As his fame grows, there's something else that grows, and it's the bullseye on his back. It's getting bigger. He's gaining more enemies. He's gaining more people that want to kill him. Now, he's not afraid of them. It's just that he's pretty early in his ministry. He's wrapping up year one. He has two more years to go. There's more teaching to do. There's more healings to do. There's more miracles to accomplish. So he's not done. So he's, he's going to a new area to do some new ministry. Now, when he hits the road, he's hitting the road for small towns. And Jesus did a lot of his ministry in those places. In fact, the nation he was born into was a nation of small towns, rural villages. Even to this day, modern-day Israel has only two major cities. If you've been there, like I have, you know that. There's, there's only Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. That's it. And Tel Aviv is a newer city. It didn't exist back then. And so even today, those two cities have less than a million people each. They're not massive places, and they were much less so in Jesus' day. So he's leaving the Jerusalem area, going up north, deep into the woods to do some more ministry. Verse 4, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Now, now that's an, an enormous statement of, of importance to the early readers of this because they knew he didn't have to go through Samaria. John, his friend, writes he had to go through Samaria, but he didn't. In fact, most people that were traveling from the city of Jerusalem up into the north country did not go through Samaria. And let me explain why. Geographically, this was the nation of Israel. It was bordered by the Jordan River to the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. You had Jerusalem in the south. You had the, the Galilee region in the north. Jesus was going from here to here. You'll notice how many main roads are there from there to there. There are three. There are three main roads. The shortest route is the white road that goes directly through Samaria. That was the shortest route, but guess what? Guess what? It was also the least traveled route. People did not take this route. It was the overgrown route. It was the route that was, pot, had, was all potholed. And nobody fixed it because people went these other routes. You would typically go the western route over towards the sea and go all the way over here to get up to Galilee. Or you'd go across the river of the Jordan, up north, and back across the river again. Why would people go to such tremendous lengths and extra distance in their journey north? Well, there was a significant reason, and that reason was Samaria. This was a bullseye on a map to any Jewish person. It was the place not to hit. It was the place to miss. You did not want to get near Samaria. Let me explain why. In their world, in the Jewish mindset, Jews were very pure of heritage. They descended from Abraham. Abraham was God's chosen person, and they had to keep their line pure. In fact, the Jewish people to give them enormous credit, went 2,000 years without living in their land and still maintained their Jewish heritage, which is unbelievable. And when 1948 and, and, and Israel became a state again, right, and they moved back in there, they were still fully Jewish people. I don't think if my family line went 2,000 years without a geographic home that we'd maintain our racial purity. In fact, I have no racial purity. I'm a mixture of a bunch of different things, and most of you are as well. But to the Jewish person... Purity of ethnicity was huge. And they would live their life in circles of fellow Jews. You know who you wouldn't spend time with, you wouldn't eat with, you wouldn't associate with? Anyone else, any non-Jewish person. And they were really clear on that. They, Jewish people were very closed off from Gentiles. In fact, the word Gentile itself was a fairly dirty word. But there was a group of people that they didn't just not associate with as Jews. There was a group of people that they despised as Jews. They were the Cowboys fans. <laughs> no, not quite. Worse than that. <laughs> they were Samaritans. And the reason Samaritans were so despised was this. They weren't just Gentiles. They were half-Jews. 
So these were the people that were disobedient, that didn't separate themselves from Gentiles. They, they, they had girlfriends, boyfriends who were out of their Jewish circle. They married, they had kids. Their kids were half-breeds. Their kids were mutts. I mean, this was, this was the thinking. And so there was this enormous despising of the Samaritans. They were so despised that they were banned from coming down here to Jerusalem to the temple. Didn't matter if they were God-fearers, if they were part of the same faith family, they were not allowed, because they had compromised with Gentiles, they were not allowed down here in the temple. And so there was all this controversy, there was all this despising, and I was racking my brain this week thinking, okay, what's the best comparison of the way they felt culturally for us today. And I joked about the Cowboys fans. You know, for some people, it'd be the Red Sox fans if you're a Yankee fan. But it's far more than that. I think it was the level of feeling that many in our culture feel towards a child sex offender. Okay? Many in our culture would not want to be near or associate with. In fact, they'd want a whole lot of other things for a child sex offender. And so I think if you, if you realize that level of disgust in our culture, that level of anger or hatred or seething, you'll begin to understand the level of hatred that a first century countryman of Jesus would feel towards Samaria. That's why you'd go out of your way to avoid it. That's why you'd take a long route to get to where you were going. But here John records, Jesus' best friend, John records, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Really important. Circle verse 4, because that tells us a lot about Jesus. Verse 5. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well, about noontime. Now, this is just a fascinating side note about Jesus, written by one of his friends, that here he is, and he is feeling what? What does John tell us he's feeling? He's feeling weary or tired. Now, remember who we're talking about. We're talking about the Son of God. At the beginning of this book, we saw that he was the creator of the universe, He's the sustainer of the universe, and he's tired. I mean, this just is a little window into the life of Jesus that shows us how much Jesus actually set aside to become one of us. Jesus knows what sore feet are like, what blisters are like, what exhaustion is like. The reason that he can empathize with our limitations is because he literally experienced them himself. I don't know of any other God who experiences what their people go through than our God. And so Jesus is exhausted, but his rest right here is he sits down near this well. It's not just because he's weary and it's not just because he's thirsty. It's not just because of his physical limitations that he's taken a pit stop here. It's very strategic because there's a divine appointment that Jesus had planned to have on this day. Verse 7. Soon, a Samaritan woman. Now, I just said that without any emotion because it doesn't bother me. But in this day, to even say that, you would have said it like a Samaritan woman. Ugh. Right? Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus, this is a huge cultural snafu, a huge issue. Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. Now, that quote right there is not kosher, pun intended. It's explosive, and here's why. First of all, Jesus is talking to an unrelated woman. You did not do that in the first century. Second of all, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. 
You did not do that as a Jewish guy. Thirdly, and this is going to come out later in the story, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman who has a reputation. And it ain't a good one. You definitely did not do that. Now, some might think, okay, this is just ignorance. Jesus is new at this. He doesn't really know who she is. You'd be wrong to think that. Jesus knows exactly who she is. And he's talking with her on purpose. In fact, he's at her village today, a village that his people avoided on purpose. Verse 8. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. So they're going to the local dollar general, obviously. The woman was surprised, for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Like, she's giving Jesus an out here. Like, you probably could tell I was a woman. But just in case you don't know, I'm a Samaritan. Like, I don't know how you missed that. Why are you asking me for a drink? She's stunned. She knows they shouldn't be having this conversation. In fact, she's probably gone her entire life without a Jewish man ever having talked to her before other than maybe to spit at her and yell at her. Imagine that, her entire life. And she has never likely had this happen before where a Jewish guy talks to her, let alone talks to her politely, let alone asks her for a drink. And Jesus replies this, if, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. You see what Jesus is doing right here? He's throwing out some bait. He's like, if you, had a, if you had any idea who I am, you wouldn't let me ask you for water. You'd be asking me for water. I have a gift from God that I'd love to give you. Just fill out your connection card. Drop it off. No. So Jesus makes this claim to this woman, and, and it makes no sense to her. It makes no sense. She doesn't have any clue what he's talking about. Verse 11 She's, she's just so befuddled. She's like, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to give me any water without a rope or a bucket. This doesn't make sense. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And beside, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Today at all of our campuses, we're going to have a clue luncheon. We're going to enjoy a meal. We're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper. We're going, to, we're going to share with you the behind the scenes at Berean. A lot of updates, a lot of news. And our hope by doing that is what you walk away today, you walk away with a clue. Well, this woman doesn't have a clue what Jesus is talking about. So Jesus is going to graciously do a mini clue meeting for her. And here is what it is. Verse 13, Jesus explains. All right, I'll explain it. Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. She knew that. She's out here every day getting water for, for herself and her household. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Jesus is saying, lady, the, the water I'm offering you is far better than this water from Jacob's well. The water I'm offering you is going to produce something inside of you. It's going to produce a fresh, bubbling spring within you. You say, well, logically, how does that work? Water comes from a, a source. It doesn't create a source. Water always comes from a water tower or a well or a river. It, it comes from something. And Jesus is like, yeah, but not my water. My water that I'm going to give you is going to create a source so that it never runs out. And that source within you, that water source, is literally going to flow into eternity and give the person who has that source eternal life. You've probably heard of the mythical fountain of youth. It's kind of a big deal if anyone ever finds it. I think we'll all go for a drink. But Jesus here 
conveys a, a fountain of life, a fountain of eternal life, and says he's offering it to her. The most unlikely candidate in Jesus' country is who Jesus offers this new water source. Verse 15. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. (laughs) I'd love this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Okay, does she get it? She doesn't have a clue. She's thinking, really? You can make a well inside of me so I never get thirsty? I'll take some of that. She doesn't have any clue what Jesus is saying. But it it just sounds so good to her to be true, too good to be true. It's like, listen, I come every day to this place, I bring my jugs, I fill them, and I walk back into town, sometimes multiple times a day. Now, the time of day that she's here meeting Jesus is a time of day when other people didn't go too well because it was too hot. Because of her reputation, this is the time of day that she apparently had to come. And so on top of the weight of the water and the distance she had to travel to get the water, it's the heat of the day. And I could only imagine carrying this water every day in these conditions. So she's like, if you can get me out of this, I'll take some of what you got. But here's what's funny. Jesus isn't offering that type of water at all. The type of water he's offering to her is better than that. Now, in her mind, there's probably not a lot that could be better than that. But what Jesus is offering is far better. He's not just offering her something that will improve her life. He's offering her something that will change her eternity. Now, she doesn't get that. And so Jesus needs to awaken her spiritual senses. She's thinking at the physical level. Jesus is talking at a different level. So Jesus has to kind of bring her to that other level he's referring to. And he does in verse 16. He says, go and get your husband. Jesus told her, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Now listen, why would Jesus say go bring your husband if he knows she doesn't have a husband? Jesus only ever asked questions that he knew the answers to. And he already knew that she didn't have a husband. Now, the reason she didn't have a husband was part of her reputation. It was part of the scandal of her life. And she just tells Jesus the bare minimum. I don't have a husband. I'm, I'm single, in other words. Well, he knows that there's more to her story. So look at the rest of verse 17. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, if any other person said this to this woman, it would have been a barbed comment. Like, yeah, I know you don't have a husband. I know who you're living with, and I know the last five guys you were with. Jesus is not condescending here. He's not arrogant here. He's simply giving her a list of her relationship history. And I want you to realize this was in a pre-Facebook world. There's no way he could have gone online and got this information on her. She is a total stranger to him. He could have never known this information. But here's the deal. She wasn't a stranger to Jesus. Jesus knew her. Jesus saw her. Jesus cared about her. And she's quickly starting to realize this. Even if every other Jewish guy in the world despised her, there's something different about this man at the well. Look at verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. She's so confused, but she's like, no one could have known that about me unless they were at least a prophet. Like, you've got to be a prophet. And there seems to be something inside of her that had always longed to meet a prophet because she's ready to go with her really hard theological questions. Like, right away, she guns a question at him as if he's a prophet. So tell me, prophet, (laughs) why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? So here's the deal. Her people, because they were banned from worshiping God in Jerusalem, they still loved God. Many of them wanted to worship God, so they built their own temple there. And that made them even more despised by the Jews. Now they viewed them as heathens and reprobates and heretics because they're doing worship different than what God had said. And they're like, yeah, but you excluded us. You didn't let us in. We have no choice but to do it here. And the Jews are like, that makes you even worse. 
that he makes you even more deplorable. And so this woman gets it. The prejudice against her people is not hidden. The hostility that she's felt her whole life has become normal. And she's never quite understood who's right. Is it my Jewish brothers and sisters? Or is it my Samaritan people? Who's right when it comes to where we worship God? And so Jesus still is in clue meeting mode, so he answers her questions. Jesus replied, believe me, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Now, now before we go further, I just want you to know what Jesus just did. He just said it really, it really doesn't matter. The time's coming when it's really not going to matter. Now, this is where she might have got some huge question marks. He's like, this matters. This is the most important thing is how you worship God, where you worship God. And Jesus is just showing her that that doesn't matter. But she does. Even the way he talks to her, dear woman, right? He's talking so graciously, so kindly to a Samaritan woman with a reputation. John has already told us about Jesus in the previous chapter. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. But the very next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And Jesus is demonstrating that in a way they've never seen before right here. He's going to the most despised place, to the most despised resident of that place, an outcast in a city, a village of outcasts. And it's here he's announcing it doesn't matter where you worship God anymore. He keeps going and he gets more controversial. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Well, they didn't. They were excluded from genuine worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, and then he says this, indeed, it's it's here now. This is not just some future time that's coming, which is what prophets would often do. There's a time coming. He's saying it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth versus in Jerusalem at the temple. That's how worship had gone for a thousand plus years. Worship happened in Jerusalem at the temple. And Jesus is like, actually, starting today, true worship is going to happen in spirit and in truth. Do you see why Jesus is having this conversation alone with her? Can you imagine if the disciples were there? They would have been unplugging the mic like hustling Jesus away. Like, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? And then he says this, the father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Right? As he's looking at this ostracized woman with compassion in his eyes, he's saying the father's looking for those, looking right at her. The father's looking for those who will worship in spirit and truth. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What Jesus announces here is absolutely history altering. Because until now, God's plan has been a select group of people. God chose Abraham to be his chosen person, to be the father of his chosen people. God has worked through the Jewish nation, through the land of Israel, and that is where salvation has come from. That is where worship has happened. And Jesus says, starting today, God's arms are going to be bigger than the Jews, and his reach is going to be further than Jerusalem. Starting today, he's opening his arms to the whole world. And he announces this to a Samaritan woman with a reputation. Now you might see why Jesus getting weary and stopping at this well wasn't an accident. From eternity past, he had planned to have a pit stop at Jacob's well on this day. 
from eternity past. He had designed the timing of this pit stop to be when his disciples were hungry and would run off to get food. From eternity past, he had designed this woman to be thirsty enough to go out to the well at this moment because he had an announcement he wanted to share with the world. And he was going to share it through her. Verse 25, check out her reaction. The woman says, <laughs> I love her reaction. I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. <laughs> Boy, I would have loved to have been there for that moment. Thank you, prophet, but I'm going to wait for Messiah to explain this to me. Like, there's no way you have the authority to change God's plan. Like, you could be a really cool prophet, and I'm impressed with everything you said so far, but, like, you can't just unilaterally change the plan of God. You can't just open up worship to Samaritans. You can't just open up worship to my region and any other region in the world. You, you, you can't just do that. So, like, I respect and I appreciate and, and, and I really love our talk. But I'm going to wait for Messiah because he'll explain this to me. There's no way, there's no way that you can just make this change on your own. And here's what's funny. Jesus had led her to this conclusion. Jesus had led her to this conclusion that only the Messiah could give this announcement. And look at Jesus' next words. Verse 26. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Whoo! If you've been following the life of Jesus, everyone's been waiting for him to say this. Everyone. His disciples. They kept urging him, like, make the announcement. We believe. Like, we've seen what you've done. We've seen your secret miracles. We believe you're the Messiah. Tell someone. And so on this day, Jesus is like, all right, I will. And they would have been like, no, not her. They're waiting for him to do the announcement in Jerusalem with their people. So their religious leaders and, and the Roman occupiers could hear he's the Messiah. And Jesus instead, instead does it in this small, out of the way, forgotten, despised town with an outcast woman. He's like, now I'm ready to make my announcement. I'm the Messiah. No cameras, no crowds. No important people. One Samaritan woman, and Jesus drops the bombshell. Here I am. I wanted you to be first to know. Now, it really shouldn't surprise us that Jesus announced it this way. It shouldn't surprise us because this is the pattern that Jesus has already had his whole life. Right? When he chose to be born in a rural village, the son of a poor teenage girl. When he chose to be welcomed the night of his birth by a bunch of filthy outcast shepherds. When he chose to be raised in a backwards town of Nazareth where they spoke with an accent that everyone picked on. When he chose to do his first miracle at a wedding in secret simply to save the embarrassment of the bride's family. That's a Jesus who doesn't need a big stage. He just wants to find broken people in forgotten places and let them know he can satisfy their soul forever. My friend, Jesus cares about forgotten people in small places. This story tells us a little bit about the woman. She was despised, rejected, and ostracized. Her reputation would have made her an outcast even in her own outcast village. She's a double outcast. It tells us a little about this woman, but it tells us a lot about this Jesus. Jesus wasn't just loving this woman with a reputation. By doing it this way, Jesus was loving, loving every person who's imperfect and messed up. Jesus wasn't just showing his love for Samaria. 
Jesus was showing his love for every small forgotten town around the world. One day in a speech in another rural area, Jesus made this comment. He said, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they? You think you're you're forgotten. You think you don't matter. You think you're not valuable. You think God doesn't see or care about you. But have you looked at the birds? They tend to be fat, all of them. Where do they get their food? Your father feeds them every day. And they don't save up and they don't store up. They're not chipmunks or squirrels. They just get their food every day from a God who sees them and provides for their needs. How much more valuable are you than a bird? God says, I see you. I care about you and your town. Look what else he said in that same speech. He said, and if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers, yesterday the kids found some orange wildflowers. They know orange is my favorite color. They were so excited to give them to me. They're all shriveled today, but they were cute yesterday. The kids aren't shriveled today. The flowers are shriveled. (laughs) They were in the sun, actually. They're shriveled too. But if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers, they're beautiful, aren't they? They're beautiful. They are here today and they're thrown into the fire tomorrow. He will certainly care for you. Jesus went to forgotten people throughout his entire life and he wanted them to know, you are more valuable than birds who I care for every day. You are more valuable than wildflowers that I clothe in the most beauty you could imagine. Will I not more see you and care for you? My friend, you may think that because you live in a small town, That because you live in a place that your kids want to move away from when they grow up, that you're forgotten, but you need to know something you're not. If you have Jesus, you have everything. And a source of water is in your soul that produces eternal life. You are not forgotten. You are not ignored because you have a God who delights in seeing the unseen, in rescuing the broken, and in healing the hurting. Jesus cares about forgotten people in small places. Don't ever forget this. In fact, Jesus spent most of his life living in, working with, and serving people from small places towns. And it's easy to think, green New York, who cares about us other than people that buy forklifts? Cincinnatus, right? We're so isolated. Bainbridge, we're forgotten. Shenango Forks, Shenango Valley, Hillcrest, Oxford, Guilford, Whitney Point, Sherburn, Sydney. No one cares about us, but you'd be wrong to think that. Because Jesus sees the forgotten. And small places are his biggest stage. Forgotten people are his best ambassadors. Jesus doesn't need a famous person to be his spokesman. He doesn't even need a popular place to be his home base. You say, why is that? Because he's God and he needs nothing. He is so secure that he doesn't have to be represented by the elite people in elite places. He just wants to choose the ordinary to do his extraordinary work. And he wants to choose the outcast to spread his amazing Good news with the rest of the world. Jesus loved visiting places like Samaria. He did it his whole life. And he wasn't just stopping to get ice cream and make the girl behind the counter scream. Jesus genuinely cares about small people, forgotten people in small places. 
I heard one guy recently say, he's small town Jesus. He has a big heart for small towns. And on this day, he made the two biggest announcements of his life. Worship can be anywhere, and I am the Messiah in a small town to the smallest person in that town. And he did it on purpose. Don't ever think God doesn't see you or care about you or your town. Would you bow with me this morning? Just as we wrap up and we're going to close in a, in a song in a moment, I want to say to you that this story isn't really about a Samaritan woman. I think this story is really about you. I think the reason John recorded this for us is to show us that Jesus goes places that no one else will go. Talks to people that no one else will talk to. Sees and cares for the forgotten and the hurting. I don't think this story is as much about her as it is about you. You have a Savior who sees you, who loves you, who wants nothing more than to rescue you and give you this living water. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever received it? This woman that day just believed We'll we'll hear the rest of the story next week and it's this crazy awesome story. She just believed. And to her that day, she got a well of living water within her soul. And she was never the same. Will you put your faith in Jesus? Will you believe that he is the son of God? Will you believe that he lived and died and rose from the dead for you? If you're willing to believe it's it's turning away, it's turning away from your past and your sin and it's turning towards a Savior who knows all of it and wants to forgive you anyway. If you believe, I want to welcome you to a family of faith where there are no outcasts, there are no strangers. To those of you who do believe, I... I want to remind you, I want to reiterate what Jesus was saying to this woman, that he had known her her whole life, that he had seen her and he cared about her and he loved her. And maybe you feel a bit ignored. Maybe you feel like you're not that valuable. Look at the way Jesus talked to and treated this woman. And that, my friends, is the way Jesus feels about you. And that is why we collectively can sing, I I, I look to the Son, I look to the Son, I look to the Son of God. He is so good, He is so kind, He is so compassionate, He is so merciful. And in small town upstate New York, He sees us. He cares for us. And he wants to use our region to be his stage. He doesn't need a big one. He just needs people who believe. Father, thank you for sending your son to forgotten places. Thank you for using people like us to be the carriers of a message that is the hope of the world. What a privilege you gave to that woman that day to tell her village about you. And what a privilege you've given us to tell our towns and our villages about you. God, help us to be your enthusiastic ambassadors. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.